This is George Courser, and I'm here today to talk to you about writing technical papers. This is part of a course for introducing PhD students to the PhD process here at Oakland University. Why write a technical paper? Well, the primary reason probably is because it is required for a PhD. Uh, two published or accepted journal or conference papers are part of the PhD requirement. The problem is, how do we know which techniques work the best for technical writing? How do we know which papers are the most significant? How do we know which uh, writing techniques work best? These types of things are difficult to determine because there's very little empirical evidence. We know which papers have been published, but we don't have a lot of information on which papers have not been published. So it's difficult to determine which items are actually going to work, which, which techniques are actually going to work best uh, to improve our percentage chance of publication. In fact, some uh, scholars have lamented that uh, the entire peer review process is political and does not guarantee the identification of high quality work, uh, but what's the alternative? We really don't have a lot of choice. We are going to have to write technical papers and we're going to have to get through these peer review committees. So, what can we do? We don't have empirical evidence. Probably the best solution is to use examples. And we might suggest that not just any examples, but the landmark papers, the best paper award winners, the best student paper award winners. These may be the most uh, representative of the ideal goals that uh, the peer reviewers are uh, seeking. Of course, there's no guarantee of this. I don't have any empirical evidence to prove this. It's just one possible solution. Just to give you a quick idea of the types of papers that get uh, accepted as the best student papers, here are the top three for the last three years, the best student papers for the ACM SIG Access Group. ACM is the Association of Computing Machinery. SIG is a special interest group, and SIG Access is the special interest group on accessibility, which is a niche for the blind and deaf and the people with special needs. So these are the top three papers for the last last three years. Now, before we begin discussing the paper writing process, let's establish our assumptions. First, we assume that all the facts that have been gathered, we don't need to do any more experimenting to determine what information needs to go in the paper, all that's been done. Second, we assume that the contribution is significant and that the audience will consider it relevant, the audience meaning the peer review committee. So the contribution is clear. Third, we assume that the audience is, in fact, the peer review committee at a specific publication, so we know the audience. Finally, the goal is to get it published. We want to increase, maximize, actually, the likelihood of publication. How does the writing process work? Well, we gather facts, we identify an audience, we determine the thesis, the point of the paper, and then we begin the writing process. Not all of the facts will be used in the thesis, obviously. Only certain ones that support the points that we're trying to make or that are relevant to the topic at hand. Please look at your handout, the Varsomopoulos paper. This describes the overall flow. Uh, there are some variations, but I think this is fair to say this is the main way that the papers are organized. First is a title, abstract, general terms and keywords section, there's an introduction section, related work, body, model, methodology, whatever you want to call it, the, the uh, structure of the solution that you're proposing, experimental results, conclusions, future work, and citations. And there's appendices and other sections here, but this should be enough for a 15-minute presentation that I'm going to give you here today. Now, uh, take a look at your handouts to follow along with what I'm going to show you here, but there, I'll also cite some other information uh, on the web. Title and abstract sections. The title is not really a section, it's a title. The abstract is a section. The title is supposed to capture the attention of the uh, desired audience. Um, here are some examples of famous papers that uh, have relatively short titles. The abstract is supposed to be clear and quick to read and, and easy to understand. I would also suggest that it be searchable, queryable, using computer tools, search boxes. The reason for this is because uh, I assume, and this may, may not be true, but I assume that people who are searching for a paper may use either the full written out term or may use acronyms when searching for papers.
papers. If you put both of them in your abstract, you'll maximize the chance of your paper being uh, uh, cited or, or found later on. Of course, this may be after uh, the publication process, but still it may be a good technique to use. Um, Here's an example of the title and abstract of the Fuzzy Sets paper. Very short title, very short abstract. Clear and meaningful. Here's an example of the title and abstract of the Best Student paper. A little bit longer title, maybe double the size abstract, uh, but there's a number in there, 13 blind people, consisting of a touchscreen text entry task, and it definitely uh, highlights themes that are of interest to that particular special interest. Group. General terms and keyword section. Now these these two sections help others to find your work. I don't know that they have any effect whatsoever on your paper getting accepted. However, once it's accepted, it may well be that uh, having more keywords and terms may may make it more findable. You can see that in the abstract to the right, uh, two terms, DDoS and CBA are enumerated in their full um, uh, translation as well as abbreviated in their acronym so that they could be found in uh, either way the person may query. The introduction. The Stanford InfoLab group says that the introduction is, is an absolutely essential part of the uh, paper and uh, they have a, a, a detailed method to write up this introduction. But basically, the point that they make, and I think they make a very good one, is that if the introduction is attractive and of interest to the reader, the person will have that in the back of their mind and will read the rest of the paper in terms of whether or not it satisfies and meets the conditions in that introduction. So, uh, let's continue and look at some other introductions. Here's the abstract for the COD paper, EF COD, Paper on Relational Algebra. Um, it starts off, in the near future, we can expect a great variety of languages to be proposed for interrogating and updating databases. That's the abstract. The introduction uses the same sentence. In the near future, we can expect a great variety of languages to be proposed for interpreting, sorry, interrogating and updating databases. This is a landmark paper. It is a model of clarity and meaning also, but uh, it does break a few rules that the Stanford InfoLand group does says, which is don't repeat yourself. Now, here's the introduction for the best student paper. It takes an even lengthier narrative approach, uh, laying down the environment, uh, touch-based devices, and so forth, uh, discusses the blind and uh, how they interact with these devices, and then it, it nails us with the uh, point, which is the goal is to identify and quantify the attributes that make a difference for a blind user. This is, of course, what the ACM uh, SIG Access Group would I assume we'd look for, and, uh, and I think they could have led with this particular paragraph, but they um, uh, decided to use a more narrative style. Doesn't want that either. The Stanford Info Lab checklist would be a good starting point for a new paper writer to use. Check this out. They have a five-point plan, five paragraphs for your introduction. What's the problem? Why is it interesting? Why is it hard? Why hasn't it been solved before, and what are the key components of your approach? That is a nice little way of laying it out, and apparently it's the standard method for Stanford. They also add a sixth paragraph, a final paragraph in the introduction section, which is a summary of contributions. This is probably a good idea to be explicit about um, what is your paper uh, actually adding to this the group of the body of knowledge that exists already. Again, this, this link is active. You can click on that and go and see this uh, directly. Related work. It's worth taking a look at the related work section. Some of us think that all we got to do is basically list a few things that are related to what the, uh, the paper that we're writing is about. But the idea is to, is to present the most relevant work. And uh, it's, this Stanford group here says it's necessary to show what has happened in the field. Actually, this is the Marcinopoulos paper here that says that. Um, and second, and maybe most importantly, it, it gives you an opportunity to, to critique the other approaches in the literature and then uh, uh, communicate what your contribution is and why your paper is important. Where does it fit in the big picture? So the related work section can actually be used to, 
to bolster your argument that your particular contribution is worthy of publication. Again, consider the Varsimopoulos paper that I handed out. Now, the body or model or methodology section of your paper uh, may be the longest one. It describes uh, the concept. It uh, often includes diagrams, and it varies so widely from paper to paper that it's hard to give you know, hard and fast rules of what to do. Uh, again, take a look at the Varsimopoulos uh, diagram and the hand up that I handed you. Uh, if your body model, you know, methodology, whatever it is you want to call it, uh, identifies the problem and lays out the structure of the solution, you've probably done a good job in that section. Now, there is a 64-point list at Columbia uh, University's website. Strongly recommend taking a look at that list, and maybe when you write your, uh, your body section of your paper, you might take a quick glance at that look at list and see if there's anything that you missed that you might want to include. The best student paper calls this the evaluation section, and the subsections within that particular evaluation section or model section include research goals, procedure, apparatus, and participants. And, uh, and these are not, you know, necessary for any particular paper, but that's what they use. Uh, the evaluation section is relatively, I don't know, short compared to what it has been in other papers. Again, there's very, a lot of variation. And one of the things that it might be worth noting is when you uh, complete the experimental results section, the next section of the paper, um, also include information about the implication of the results. When you read these papers, there's nothing wrong with just papers that tell you and report the results with numbers. Nothing wrong with that. But the, the uh, Stanford Interlab uh, group, and I think also the Varsimopoulos paper, suggest that don't just say what the results were, but also say why they are significant, why they're important, what they, what they could mean. Um, and also address any potential challenges. Don't forget that people may disagree that your results are that meaningful. Uh, if you... If you address those challenges right there in the paper, it makes it a stronger work. Now, the uh, addressing challenges section uh, is, is, a, is done, I thought, very well in the best student paper, pros and cons section of their paper. It's 4.4. It basically lists through a bunch of challenges of their particular solution. And so, uh, you know, they even think that one of the contributions is that it that they do a, a review of the various solutions. So uh, you can use this uh, this results section to again bolster the, the paper's value. Finally, we're going to discuss the conclusions and future work sections. In the conclusion, the Stanford InfoLab suggests using just a short summarizing paragraph and with no repetition. Again, a lot of the landmark papers do violate this particular rule, but uh, that Stanford's rule is good enough uh, for me. The future work section gets uh, short shrift by most of the websites I've looked at. Um, talking to people, some, some published authors dismiss the whole section as unimportant. In fact, in the best student paper, uh, it, it omitted this entire section. So, again, it, all, of this, all of the things that I've suggested to you could be, well, they are, they're opinions. They're just opinions. There's no evidence to support them. Uh, the only thing we can look at is uh, indications that, uh, that these best papers uh, uh, have them in it or don't have them in it. But just because the best student paper omitted the section does not mean the future workers are worthless. Uh, and, but it also doesn't prove that it's worthwhile either. We just don't know. Citations and references may well be the most important topic to cover when writing a paper. Unfortunately, it is way too complicated for a 15-minute presentation. This is something that needs to be thought through and understood well by all doctoral candidates, and uh, I, I will not going to reduce it to a superficial list of obvious points um, uh, because it really deserves better than that. But I did find three websites. Those links are, are live. Plagiarism.org, Web of Science, and Cybers. Uh, of course, each journal has its specific citation formats uh, that, uh, that you need to use for the publication. But uh, again, this is a very important section, but uh, again, if 
beyond the scope of this presentation. So, conclusion, number one, technical writing is required for a PhD. Number two, the evaluation criteria for determining which papers get published, these evaluation criteria vary widely. A lot of opinions, very few facts on what actually constitutes publishable work. We have shown, I have shown in this presentation, that you can use examples, landmark papers and best paper award winners, to determine whether or not your paper compares uh, to the peer reviewer's acceptance criteria. I do not submit this as evidence. I simply submit it as a suggestion. I hope it has been useful for you. And my 15 minutes are up. Hope you enjoyed the presentation.